When I started actively being part of the ex-Muslim community on social media around four years ago, I noticed that ex-Muslims were often angry in their interactions with Muslims. They would come up with all sorts of insulting nicknames for Islam. They'd use every conceivable insult to attack Muslims' personalities, their intelligence, their appearance, and of course, inevitably, Muslims would return the favor. So many arguments that it might have started in a thoughtful way would descend into this sort of name-calling. The thing is, I understand where the anger on both sides is coming from. To talk about the Muslim side for a second, they feel like the religion that is their spiritual and cultural foundation in life is being attacked. And I also saw the limitations of this kind of engagement. Those limitations are why I never call Islam things like Pislam. I'll share why I don't in a couple minutes, but it's important first to understand ex-Muslims' motivations for cursing Islam and where their anger is coming from. Some might think that anger is unjustified and purely rooted in blind hatred. But put yourself in an ex-Muslim's shoes. You no longer believe whether that's because of the suffering Islam's teachings have caused you, or because you realize you have no good reasons to believe. More than likely, it's a combination of both. So you no longer believe, but that has consequences once it's out in the open. You can be shunned and shamed by friends and loved ones, subjected to verbal abuse and loss of your job, and in the worst cases, you can experience physical violence and even death. After all, the death penalty for leaving Islam is endorsed by mainstream interpretations of Islamic law. To avoid all these dire consequences, you hide your lack of faith. You hide your true feelings and pretend to still believe. You probably are still doing Islamic practices and following Islamic commands that you dislike and that have harmed you and others in the past, and that continue to harm you and others. Unsurprisingly, living this double life leads to resentment, bitterness, and frustration. You just want to express who you are and stop doing things that aren't who you are. But you can't, out of fear. With very few outlets to safely express these feelings, you turn to social media. You express your feelings in a space where the Muslims in your life won't find out. And you vent against the religion that is an unassailable force looming over you. You call it Pislam and all sorts of other things. And it feels good to finally be able to vent, to take a stab at a powerful religion that controls your life and the lives of so many other people. Or perhaps you don't hide your lack of faith, but you feel angry. That anger makes sense. You believed in Islam and built your identity on its truth, only to realize there's no good reason to believe Islam truly comes from the creator of the universe, who, by the way, also has no good evidence for his existence. You feel lied to, deceived, promised an afterlife that could be as imaginary as Narnia or Middle Earth. You spend so much time feeling guilty and afraid and ashamed, only to discover that all that negative energy pulling you down and crippling you is built on thin air. When I left Islam as a teenager, I felt that anger. I was pissed off. I wasn't mad at Islam and I wasn't mad at Allah. I mean, I didn't believe he existed anymore. But I was mad at all the Muslim parental and authority figures in my life, like my parents and my teachers. I was mad at the world for allowing Islamic indoctrination to fill my head when I was an impressionable child who believed everything he was told. I was mad at all the needless suffering Islam had caused me, the nightmares and anxiety revolving around sin and hell, the shame around my feelings of sexual desire, all that wasted time dwelling on things I realized didn't matter. And as I got older and experienced more of the world and encountered other formerly religious people and learned their stories, I got mad at the much worse suffering many of them had endured because of what their religions taught. I call this my anger phase. I wonder if it's a phase that most ex-religious people go through at one point. I could feel the anger boil within me if the subject of Islam ever came up. If I saw the hypocrisies of Muslims around me who weren't even fully following the faith they believed was so good and so true, what would still be homophobic, for example. I personally never called Islam Pislam, but I insulted Muslims whenever the subject of Islam came up. I called Muslims ignorant idiots, clueless sheep who were holding the world back. As I've shared just now, those feelings of anger and bitterness are totally valid, and there can be a therapeutic release in expressing them publicly on social media. But you have to note one thing, once you put something out there, it has other impacts too. Eventually I realized this anger and bitterness, although it felt good and might have some positive results, it also had a negative impact. I realized that the Muslims I was disparaging, including the Muslims within my own family, were people just like me, often born into Islam and indoctrinated like I was. They were not idiots, they were not clueless sheep. I wasn't any better than them. I just had to open my eyes to the possibility that Islam wasn't true, and for reasons I understood very well, those Muslims wouldn't 
or couldn't open their eyes to that possibility. In that sense, I saw that Muslims who abuse ex-Muslims are victims of Islam's teachings too. In a broader sense, I saw that being angry of Muslims insulting them wasn't going to make things better. If anything, it would probably alienate them further. I mean, I run this channel with a fake name, which gives me the freedom to say a lot of things about Islam that I'd be too afraid to say if I didn't have that anonymity. But even with that anonymity, I never use those sorts of crude insults about Islam. That's because I share my content for specific purposes. I started off wanting to share my perspective and highlight the voices of other ex-Muslims who can't put themselves out there like I have, as a way to support them and help normalize their existence so that one day, they don't have to hide anymore. And the more I kept posting, the more I wanted my content to reach believing Muslims, so they could assess my perspective and the problems with Islam that I'd shared, to get them thinking, to challenge their biases. You can't control what offends people, obviously, but I'd learned and knew from my time as a Muslim that there were some very obvious big things that would offend Muslims to the point where many of them would likely tune out anything else you have to say. Using crude and honestly lazy insults is one of those things. I'm not saying I'm some perfect saint who never gets angry or frustrated during my interactions with Muslims and feasts in general, but I try not to express those feelings in insult form or otherwise. Whether you're an ex-Muslim or someone else who wants to criticize Islam, you don't get much of a positive impact from saying Pislam when you post something or if you're interacting with a Muslim. That criticism doesn't really have any content to it. If I were to offend a Muslim, I prefer the offending statement to be something of substance that they'd have to consider, at least a little bit. I know for sure that I've offended a lot of Muslims for all sorts of reasons, with one example being my assertion that Islam oppresses women and explaining why I think so. But I'm okay with that offending them because at least the argument is processed in their minds in some way. Simply using insults doesn't accomplish that. It just aggravates. Of course, there is a big counter to this position I'm taking. If we avoid saying things to avoid offending people who disagree with us in the hopes that they'll listen to us, that will give them the power to control discourse by being offended. It's a potential slippery slope that some Muslims are actually actively using by labeling legitimate criticisms of the religion as Islamophobia. That's why it's important to draw the line somewhere. I've drawn the line underneath a few of the obvious big things. Besides crude insults, I won't visually depict the Prophet Muhammad, for example, which aggravates Muslims to no end, and I won't do it unless I have a really good reason to do it. But reasoned criticisms of Islam's teachings and arguments against the truth of Islam, and even satire and comedy that make fun of Islam, are all part of my approach, no matter how many Muslims are offended by these things. Now having said this, I'm not saying that all ex-Muslims and critics of Islam in general should follow my exact approach. Each of us should be free to draw the line where we choose. Whatever their motives, people should be free to post crude insults and drawings of the Prophet Muhammad. But for me, my main goals are to get acceptance of ex-Muslims in the Muslim community, and to reach Muslims with my ideas, my arguments, and things like name-calling Muslims and making up crude, insulting names for Islam get in the way of that. So it all depends on the impact you want to create in the world, what you believe is the best way to create that impact. Now, to keep looking at this from a different perspective, you could argue that using insults to target Islam contribute to normalizing more thoughtful criticisms and destroying the aura of unquestionable sanctity and truth it possesses. It could also normalize leaving Islam. This might be true, but I believe you can destroy that aura and normalize criticism in other ways. By presenting well-thought-out arguments that challenge Islam, by sharing the legitimate perspectives of ex-Muslims. You can even do it with other mediums like stand-up comedy. You don't need to resort to crude insults to crack the edifice of Islam. Islam can be cracked by reasoned arguments and honest, uncompromising introspection that can be encouraged with challenging questions. To go back to the Pislam insult, aside from the obvious lazy mocking wordplay, some critics highlight anecdotes, like when the Prophet Muhammad ordered some sick people to drink camel urine to treat their illness. If I wanted to use what to our 21st century minds is an odd and kind of embarrassing story to crack Islam's aura of perfection, I'd ask Muslims how they square this anecdote with modern science and nutrition. A discussion could then follow that it has the potential to get both sides thinking. In my opinion, saying Pislam first or even in response to an insult from the Muslim sabotages such a discussion and results in a game of swapping insults instead. But here's one last point. 
You could also argue that using content that's as abrasive and aggressive as possible will actually lead to more people consuming your content. Just think of how social media algorithms seem to prioritize things that create lots of engagement through conflict. I think of how controversy tends to grab more of our attention, generally speaking. One great example is ex-Muslim YouTuber Apostate Prophet, whose more nuanced criticisms have reached a big audience along with his much more provocative content that enrages Muslims. But do the positives outweigh the negatives in his kind of approach? Maybe they do, but I'm not sure. What I know is it's not the approach I'd want to follow in connecting with people, whether they're Muslims or not. And that about does it for this video. Do you agree with my approach? Do you disagree? Let me know your thoughts in the comments. And if you enjoyed my exploration of this topic, please like this video, and if you haven't already, I'd really appreciate it if you could subscribe to this channel. I'm Secular Spirit, signing off. Until next time.